Welcome to Creation, Teaching Truth with Confidence, a biblical training program for teens and above. Now let's join Mike as he teaches about the days of creation. Our subject is the days of creation, and we're on session two of this subject titled, Six Biblical Evidences the Days of Creation Were Literal Days. And our objectives for this session will be, number one, state two rules of biblical hermeneutics. That's our review from session one. Second, state how Genesis chapter 1 verse 5 supports the days of creation were literal days. Three, state two evidences the days of creation were literal days. And four, state why creation is an important issue. Now, when it comes to understanding the days of creation, we need to ask some very important questions before we get started. First, does the Bible give enough information to actually determine how long these days of creation were? Second, are the days of creation literal days or long ages, and does it really matter? And finally, what should Christians believe about creation? Now, on this topic, we're in chapter 1 of Genesis, the very first chapter of the Bible, and the stakes are very high on what we really believe. For example, it deals with the authority of Scripture. When can we really trust the Bible? Secondly, when can we trust the plain reading of Scripture? And if it's not in Genesis 1, who's going to make the rules when we can start believing what it has to say? And third, the Bible's history. See, if we can't trust the Bible's history, then why should we trust its theology? Now, let's get to our review piece here. The five rules of hermeneutics, because we're going to apply those in this session also. The five rules of hermeneutics. Number one was context. Let's keep God's word in the context he gave it to us and not change it. Number two, the explicit constrains the implicit. What did that mean? If something is explicitly stated, it has a higher priority than what you might imply it means. Third, the purpose of communication. God is not the author of confusion. That is what man brings to the table, confusion. Four, the interpretation must be based on the author's intention of meaning and not the reader's intent. That got us back to what was the history and culture at the time when the people were putting Scripture together. And five, be sensitive to the type of literature or genre. The Bible we saw was written in many different literary formats. It was written in narrative history. It's written poetry, parables, figures of speech, and so on. We need to make sure we understand the type of literature we're reading when we read biblical texts. Then we also had a very important verse, 2 Timothy 2.15, that mandated us to apply hermeneutics when we read the Bible. And it states this, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we saw that word diligent meant study. We're to study God's word, and rightly dividing mean accurately handle. This is what we're going to do in this session. We're going to study the word day in the Bible in Genesis chapter 1 to help us determine what it really means. So the word day. This session, six biblical evidences that we're going to use to support the days of creation were literal days. So evidence number one. God explicitly chose the word day in the Hebrew, it's yom, that's the Hebrew word for day. So God explicitly chose the word day to describe the length of time for each creation period. Folks, that is rule number two in hermeneutics. The explicit constrains the implicit. In other words, God explicitly chose the word day. There are other Hebrew words he could have chosen that could have meant long periods of time, but none of those were chosen. God explicitly had the word day put in his text to mean a literal day. Let's go to evidence number two. The first use of the word day is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, where day is used to describe the light portion of day. Now, what does Genesis 1, 5 state? It says, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and morning were the first day. Now, notice there, in that verse, he, just, he defines the word day twice. The first definition is the light portion of a day. The second definition, it could be evening, morning, or the light and dark portion of a day. So God clearly defines the word day. Folks, this is rule number three in our hermeneutics, the purpose of communication. God is not the author of confusion. He made it very plain here 
what a day is. It's either the light portion or it's the light and dark portion. So there we have our definition. The purpose of communication. God is not the author of confusion here. Now, how about evidence number three? The days are numerically numbered. We see first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. And remember our rules of hermeneutics, context. The explicit constrains the implicit. And then communication, the purpose of communication. God put a number with each of the days here. What's so interesting about that? Well, every time, every time in the Old Testament we see have a number, we have a number used with the word day, it means a day. That's pretty easy. Now, we're talking about an ordinal number here. Now, what's an ordinal number? That's ordered numbers. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Cardinal numbers are like one, two, three, four, five. So every time, there's only one possible exception here, only one possible exception in the entire Old Testament that comes from Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. But in any case, when you look at the full context of Hosea chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it cannot mean long ages. That is an incorrect interpretation. It can only mean a literal day or a very short period of time, such as a week or two weeks or in that time frame. So, in essence, every time we see a number with the word day, it means a day. Evidence number four. Day is bounded by evening and morning. God clearly gave us when each day began and when each day ended. He put boundaries around them. Evening and morning were the first day. Evening and morning were the second day. Evening and morning were the third day. He defined the days again for us, evening and morning. And again, let's apply our hermeneutics there. Not opinions and not your personal interpretation, but the rules of understanding language, context. The explicit constrains the implicit, the purpose of communication. God has given us all this information that these days were literal days. Every time. In the Old Testament, we see evening and morning. Even when those, those words are not used with the word day, it still means a literal day. So rule number one, the meaning of the word day, or yom, is understood by its context. God explicitly chose the word day again. He defined it. He put a number with it. He bounded it by evening and morning. Folks, remember the rule? The plain reading is the normal way we should interpret Scripture unless there's something obviously there to say it means something else. And folks, I challenge anyone to find anything in that text that obviously says it's not meant to be taken literally. Now, again, it's obviously within the text, not something outside of the text. So God has given us all the information we need. Robert McCabe who's a doctor of Old Testament languages, Ph.D. Old Testament languages, makes this statement. Whether evening and morning are used together in a context with day, or they're used without day, they're used consistently in the Old Testament as a reference to literal days. Dr. Wang, Ph.D. in Biblical Studies, professor of Biblical Hebrew, states, In Genesis 1, Yom comes with evening and morning and is modified by a number. So it's obvious that the Hebrew text is describing a 24-hour day. There's four evidences. We've got two to go here. Let's look at evidence number five. Genesis chapter 1 verse 14 reads, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Now what do you notice about this verse? What is, you should notice here is God is giving us three different time periods here. A day, a season, and a year. And a year is longer than a season, which is longer than a day. That is very clear here. The problem here is, if we make a day a long period of time, then how long is a season and how long is a year? See, the whole verse Genesis 1 verse 14 makes absolutely no sense. We can just throw it away because it makes no sense if we make a day a long period of time. Because then you have to ask how long was a year and how long was a season. They have no definitions anymore. So that's rule number three again. The purpose of communication. God 
knows how to communicate better than any of you out there know how to communicate, folks. He is not the author of confusion. That is what man brings to the table, confusion, by trying to add things into God's Word that are not obviously there. Judd Davis, Ph.D. in Biblical Studies, professor of Greek, writes this, A plain language reading of the Bible produces the idea that Adam was created by God without biological ancestors. And God's creation in the universe occurred in the relatively recent past and happened over a period of six days. Again, that's rule number one. Take the plain reading unless there's something obviously there that says no. Now let's go to the last evidence in this session. Evidence number six, which is Exodus 20, verse 11. Now I want to start this piece of evidence by asking some questions. How many of you out there really believe the Ten Commandments? They're several thousand years old. We've learned a lot of new things since then. Do you still believe the Ten Commandments? Yes, I think they're very practical for today still. I think they're practical for all time. Well, here's another question then. Who wrote the Ten Commandments? Well, when we read Scripture, it's very plain. God wrote these down on the stone tablets himself. He wrote these down. Yeah, but another question. If we were to turn to the book of Exodus and read the Ten Commandments, do you think you could understand them? Well, let's take a couple, for example. How about the commandment that says, Thou shalt not steal. Does that really mean that, or is that open to our interpretation? Well, I believe God gave it to us to really mean that we're not supposed to steal from someone else. How about the commandment that says, Thou shalt not murder. Does that really mean that, or is that open to our interpretation? Well, I think God made that very plain. We're not just supposed to go out there and murder people. Now, so God wrote these down, and he communicated them to us so we could clearly understand them. Now let's go to commandment number four, Exodus 20, verse 11, and it reads this way. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Do you see what God wrote down on the stone tablets himself? He wrote down six days. Exactly what he said in Genesis chapter 1. Therefore, if we don't believe the days of creation in Genesis 1 were literal days, then this commandment, commandment number 4, does not mean what it literally says either. If commandment number 4 is open to our interpretation, what about the other nine commandments? Are they also open to our interpretation? You see, when we give up our foundation in the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, the rest of the Bible starts to be open to whatever we want it to believe. See, the real question here, as Christians, if you really think you know who God is, if you really know who God is, the real question should not be millions and billions of years. That shouldn't even enter into the idea here. The real question we should be asking if we know who God is, is not that it took millions of years, but why did God take so long as six days to do his creation? When he could have done it in one second or in six seconds. Why did he take so long as six days? And he answers that question for us in the Ten Commandments, where he puts down work six, rest one. We have a very practical God. He gave us a model for how to live and work our lives. Work six, rest one. That's understanding our, who our God is. See, when we start putting millions of years in there, we're, we're saying, God, you couldn't do it. You didn't know how to communicate to us. Yes, he does. He's not the author of confusion. Work six, rest one. That's why he took so long as six days to do his creation. Douglas Hamp has a master's in the Hebrew Bible and a Ph.D. in Biblical Studies, says this, Genesis chapters 1 through 11 are the foundation of our worldview. If we interpret those six days to mean simply six days, then we have an easy path for the remainder of the Bible. What it says is what it means. Now, Dr. David DeWitt, Ph.D. in Neuroscience, states, According to Biblical creation, Genesis 1 through 11 provides an accurate, historical account of real events that occurred as recorded. The creation of the heavens and the earth took six days and took place in the exact order that is specified. 
On each day, a normal solar day, 24 hours a night, God made different things and then rested on the seventh day. There's our six evidences. But why is this whole issue of creation so important? Why is it important that we accept six literal days? Well, John MacArthur, president of Master's College and Seminary, states it this way. I'm convinced the opening chapters of Genesis are not optional. They establish the vital foundation for everything we believe as Christians. What he's telling us there, and this is true, what he says here, is almost every one of our Christian doctrines has their foundation in the first chapters of Genesis. If we destroy Genesis, change Genesis, say it didn't really happen, then what are we going to do with the rest of our doctrines? The same thing. Dr. Robert McCabe, Ph.D. in Old Testament Languages and Literature, puts it this way. Genesis is the foundation for the remaining 65 books of the Bible. What he's telling us there is the first three chapters of Genesis, folks, is the reason the whole rest of the Bible had to take place. In other words, after Genesis chapter 3, the entire rest of the Bible is God's plan of redemption and restoration. Without those first three chapters, we don't have much of a foundation to stand on. And then finally, David Hunt, senior pastor, states, Genesis is absolutely foundational to the gospel and much of our Christian doctrine. In other words, the whole reason Jesus had to go to the cross is founded in the first three chapters of Genesis. If those first three chapters of Genesis are not real history, then Jesus suffered and died a horrible death on that cross for something that never really happened. The Bible is also a book about history, and we need to trust its history. Jonathan Sarfati, Ph.D. in Physical Chemistry. The rest of the Bible treats Genesis as real history, and the reality of the history is foundational to crucial teachings about our faith and morality. Why is this so important? If we can't trust the Bible's history, then why should we trust its theology? So we've had six evidences in this session. God specifically chose the word day, not some other word. He defined the word day in Genesis chapter 1, verse 5. He put a number with the word in each case. He defined it by evening and morning, bounded the word day by evening and morning. Genesis 1, 14 gives a distinction between three different time periods, a day, a season, and a year. And then finally, Exodus 20, verse 11, where God wrote down himself six days. So a review of what we've gone through. We've reviewed hermeneutics. What was hermeneutics? The study of the methods to how to interpret language, especially the Bible. We went through six biblical evidences of creation that were literal days and why creation is important. Now we're ready for our little final exam. Let's start here. Review one. State two rules of hermeneutics. Well, number one was Context. I hope we're getting that one now. Context is so important. Rule number two, the explicit constrains the implicit. Something is explicitly stated has a higher priority than what you imply it means. Three, the purpose of communications is to convey an understandable idea. Four, interpretation must be based on the author's intention of meaning and not the reader's intent. And five, be sensitive to the type of literature or format the Bible is written in. Next question, state how Genesis chapter 1 verse 5 supports the days of creation were literal days. Well, let's read through this. God specifically defines the word day to be either the light portion of a day or the evening and morning, which also refer to the light and dark portion. So God defines the day there. Next question, state two biblical evidences the days of creation were literal days. Well, we had six of them in this session. Number one, God chose the word day. Two, the day is defined in Genesis chapter 1, verse 5. Three, a number with the word day always means a day. Fourth, he bounded the word day by evening and morning. And then Genesis 1, 14 gave us three different time periods, a day, a season, and a year, all different periods of time. And finally, number six, Exodus 20, verse 11, commandment number four, God wrote down himself six days. Now, state why creation is an important issue. Well, number one, it deals with the authority of Scripture. When do we believe it? When don't we believe it? What can we add or subtract to it? Secondly, if the history is not true, 
Why should we trust the theology? And finally, the first three chapters of Genesis lay the foundation for the rest of the Bible. And that is the end of session two, the days of creation. Session three, we're going to go through five more evidences the days of creation were literal days. Thank you.